finally at gears. Uh, this is one of my favorite topics. I really enjoy doing this as a hobby. Um, it gets frustrating, it's time consuming, I get that. In fact, if I had to do this as full-time work, it'd probably drive me nuts. But since I'm a hobbyist, I really enjoy doing this. You learn a lot about your axle, um, which is good because if you're on the trail and you break like I did, I knew exactly what I had to do to limp my Jeep home. So that was a, a good opportunity for me to apply the stuff that I had learned in the garage out on the trail. So moving on to some components uh, and parts and things like that, I'm hoping to answer a lot of questions that may come up first, and then if I still don't uh, get your question answered, you can put it down in the comment section and I'll reach back out to you when I get a chance. Um, and hopefully we can uh, walk you guys through a gear setup and you're able to do this on your own. So starting off, let's talk about ring gear size. Um, my Jeep behind me has a Dana 44 rear and a Dana 30 front. A Dana 44 rear ring gear is eight and a half inches in diameter, where the Dana 30 is seven inches. Now I'm not gonna go off and say that this ring gear is massive, because if you put it next to a Dana 60 ring gear, um, it's gonna kind of look like the Dana 30 does to the Dana 44. But in my application, um, it's all I need. I'm running 35 inch tires. The Dana 30 on the front side is strong. Um, I'm kind of leaning towards my ring gear uh, braking because my rear ARB wasn't working. I wasn't locking up and I was putting a lot of uh, uh, stress on the front axle to do the majority of the work. And I didn't really have a choice. So I'm in the middle of a trail when this happens. So um, when that happens, things are, are bound to break and it's just part of the the uh, Jeep life, I guess. So um, looking at the ring gears here, one of the questions that comes up often is, do I need a new carrier? And the, the, the question is, depends on what gears you're gonna go with. So um, ring gear ratios have a carrier brake. I'm not gonna go into details on why and how and all this stuff is. We're just gonna make this simple. So if you're running a Dana 30 and you are running um, uh, oh my God, uh, 373 and higher numerically, then you're gonna need a new carrier if you don't already have gears higher than 373 in there. If you're gonna stay below 373, which the next one would be 354, if you're gonna go 354 and down numerically, then you would stay with the carrier, carrier you have if you're within that ratio range. Um, the one way to look at it as the carrier brake on my ARB right here. So the carrier brake is all based off of this little section right here. You see this uh, flange sitting here. <clears throat> it's about, oh, three eighths of an inch thick, I guess, anywhere between a quarter and three eighths of an inch, three eighths of an inch thick on this. This is for a, uh, uh, 373 and up gear. Now I have an old uh, ARB flange here that is for 354 and down and you can see hopefully the distance uh, or the width difference between those two and that is how you um, tell what carrier you're gonna have and where you need to go. Hopefully you could see that. Um, if not, I'll uh, post some pictures up to kind of clarify that. Now there is one way to get around a a carrier change because the carrier is going to cost you about a hundred bucks if you go a locker it's going to be about a grand but if you're going to install a locker then just get the one you need for the appropriate gear ratio but one way to get around having to get a new carrier um, is now they make what's called thick gears the thick gears make up the difference of that width and uh, you don't need to get a new carrier with one exception that I'm aware of. I haven't researched it lately, but when I uh, uh, got this ARB, it originally came with this case. I bought this uh, brand new off of uh, Craigslist. Um, got it, I think, for $400, so that was a really good deal, but it was a 354 uh, and down um, carrier brake on that, so I had to 
get hold of ARB, order a new case that would uh, bring me up to the 373 and up. And the reason I had to do that instead of going to thick gears is that at the time, which is probably I think six years ago or so, at the time nobody was making thick gears in reverse rotation. So I run a high pinion 30, so the ring gear runs reverse compared to the low pinion 30, which the TJ has. And uh, so that forced me to buy um, another half, which cost me another 180 bucks. So, you know, by the time it's all said and done, I wasn't saving as much money as I thought I was going to, but still, anyway, moving on, let's talk about that uh, standard rotation versus reverse rotation. When you look at your gears and you look at your axle, and, and this should be uh, simple to follow along, a TJ, um, a TJ front axle, uh, Dana 30, um, Dana 44, the rear Dana 44, those are all low pinion axles. And what that means is when you're looking at the axle housing itself, the pinion comes out of the bottom side of the axle housing. So when you're looking at this, your pinion gear to your ring gear would be down here. On a high pinion housing, the pinion is up higher and it would run from here. So as you can tell, so th um, this, is a, uh, this is a reverse uh, um, pinion for a high pinion 30. This is a standard 44, so the gears aren't gonna mesh. But you can tell how they're not gonna mesh. Those things, they just clash right there because it's not designed to be high pinion here. So the low pinion comes from the bottom side, high pinion comes from the top side. And um, uh, actually, this one be reversed. Anyway, um, as you're as you're looking at this on a Dana 30, the reason I went with the high pinions a couple uh, uh, for a couple of reasons. Number one, the high pinion keeps my axle shaft out of the rocks. My axle shaft still gets some um, uh, scrapes and dings on it, even being raised up um, out of the rocks like that. So that's a huge, huge advantage. If you're running low pinion, you're gonna probably see more damage on your drive shaft if you're running in the rocks like I do. Um, the other thing about the uh, high pinion that's nice, at least in the front, is that on a, on a Dana 30, you can see that this is a, a smaller ring gear, um, but it, it pushes the axle forward on the drive side of the teeth. So when you look at these teeth right here, you're gonna see one side of the tooth is almost perpendicular, the other one's at a slant. And the ring gear, I'm sorry, the pinion gear will push against that flatter side. It's called the drive side of the ring gear, the other side's called the coast side but it's gonna push against that um, drive side of the ring gear, which gives it um, yeah, a little more strength. There's numbers all over out there, anywhere from 20 to 40% more strength from pushing on the, uh, the drive side. I don't know what the exact number is on it. Um, if it adds strength, I'm happy with it. So that's all there is to the carrier brake. Now, a lot of people are gonna um, ask, hey, why do you use Revolution gears versus some of the others? You know what, there's a ton of gear manufacturers out there. You have, uh, you could use OEM Dana Spicer, you could use, uh, let's see, Nitro, Yukon, Motive. There's a bunch of um, uh, gear manufacturers out there. They source uh, their gears from overseas, um, with the exception, I think, Dana Spicer, I'm sure, is made in USA, but you pay a premium for that. Um, I go with Revolution gear specifically. They're a Circle K gear, which uh, indicates it's a little bit higher quality. Um, I've set up a lot of these. I really uh, like working with them. They sit up super easy and they run super quiet. There's other gears you get out there and those things hum pretty good. Revolution has been um, uh, great for me. I haven't, oh God, where's some wood? I haven't had anything return to me yet on those other than my own broken one. Um, but I haven't had anything return to me yet on those. These things are just uh, um, great, great gears. And disclaimer, I am not sponsored by Revolution. I'm not sponsored by anybody in any way with this YouTube channel as of right now, but um, uh, I, I use their gears just because I love them. That's all there is to it. So it is time to talk about some tools and uh, things you'll need to help out with your setup. So I'm not gonna go into every single tool that you're gonna need for a gear setup because it's, it's gonna be different based on the axle you have as far as uh, ring gear, bolt size, as far as carrier uh, um, bearing cap bolts, all that stuff's gonna be standard type tools. 
I'm gonna go over just the, the um, specialty tools that you would need to do this uh, gear setup. Now, the one tool that I don't have um, is a case spreader. Now, case spreader is um, used to pull the carrier or the locker in and out of the case. You don't have to have one. In fact, I've never used one in all the uh, um, gear setups that I've done. It's on my list of things to build. I wanna build one just because I think it'd be a, a fun project. I just haven't had the time to get around to it yet. Um, but it is not needed uh, by any stretch of the imagination. Will it make it easier? I don't know, I've never used one, so um, I can't comment on that. But a case spreader, um, I, I can see where it would make it easier getting that carrier in and out when you're trying to get your preload on your carrier bearings because um, there, there's times, especially when you're working with the ARB and you have your seal housing and the copper line, everything's kind of getting in the way, you're trying to get everything lined up, it would be nice to just drop it in there, um, release the pressure on the, uh, on the uh, case spreader and, and be done with it, but not required. Um, so I'm only going over specialty tools, like I said, not all the other tools. Um, first thing, let's talk about a caliper. You need a, um, a, a decent caliper that's going to uh, be able to measure your shims that you're going to be using for your setup. Shims come in various sizes, um, typically uh, three thousandths of an inch, five thousandths of an inch, ten thousand, twenty thousand. Um, those are pretty common and you kind of use a mixture of those to, um, to get your numbers where you need them to be. But you do need something to measure how thick they are and then when you write them down on your shims and you start getting your stuff dialed in, you have to figure out where it's gonna go and what went where and add from here, subtract from there and it's easy to get lost. So the better you are set up at the beginning, um, the better your gear setup will go. The next uh, specialty tool is an inch pounds torque wrench. You can either get like what I have, a beam style, um, bike shops, you can find this online. These run about, oh, probably 30 or $40, I'm guessing. Um, and what this is used for um, is to measure the rotational force to rotate your pinion. And I'll get into that when we're setting up the gears. But you cannot, cannot use a clicker style or click style torque wrench. It just doesn't work that way. You have to be able to read a constant rotational force. And a click style, once it gets there, you still have no idea of where you're at. Um, so it just doesn't work. You have to have beam style or you can get a dial uh, style, but that dial style, those are pretty expensive and then kind of a specialized tool there. So if you're gonna use it a lot, you work in a gear shop, I get it. I would get one of those too, but this is what I use as a hobbyist. One of the other things uh, that you're going to need is a dial indicator, a magnetic dial indicator um, that allows you to put it on the face of your uh, axle housing and then you take your indicator, put it on your ring gear tooth and then you could measure backlash and backlash is nothing more than the amount of, of space between your pinion gear and your ring gear. Uh, where they mesh. It's just the amount of space. Too little backlash, you're not able to get lubrication in between the teeth. Too much backlash, you get really clunky and it just doesn't uh, run very well and you're, you're destined for um, gear failure. So backlash is important and the only way you're going to measure that is by using uh, a dial indicator. And if you look at this, you'll, you'll see the dial there. When you put this up against the teeth, you're gonna see that needle move and around. And when you move the ring gear back and forth, that's what's gonna measure your backlash. So you see how tight that tolerance is. Now, typical gear setups, your backlash is gonna be anywhere between, I don't know, say five and 12 thousandths of an inch. So that's why you can't just do it by feel, you can't do it by hear. Now I can get close, I can know when I'm in the ballpark, but to get exactly where you need it, the only way you're gonna do that is with the dial indicator. Um, not necessarily a specialized tool here, but definitely one that is needed is a dead blow hammer. Um, especially if you don't have a um, case spreader, you're gonna use this to, to work that carrier into the housing. Um, you can, you're gonna find that you're gonna use this thing a lot for different aspects of this, uh, for this gear setup. You know, when you need to get the pinion back out to make some adjustments, you can tap on the end of that with this and it's gonna help get that out. Um, Lots of use for a dead blow hammer, not truly specialized, but I threw it in there just to make sure you have one before you get everything apart. 
Okay, some things that aren't a specialty tool, um, but are, are needed to help you with your setup um, are gonna be some setup parts. For example, on a carrier, now just to imagine this is not an ARB, because ARBs are a little bit different. Imagine this is a standard open carrier. The shims, your carrier uh, shims go underneath your bearing. And the only way that you're going to make your adjustments on your carrier position in the axle housing is by putting your shims on, putting your bearing on, take measurements, figure out where you're at, take the bearing back off, make your adjustments, put your bearing back on, take your measurements, figure how far off you are, take your bearing back off, make some adjustments, put your bearing back on, are you there? Okay, and it, it can be a number of times that this bearing has to uh, go on and off. So the way around that, unless you happen to own a, another specialized tool, which is a clamshell puller, and a good clamshell puller is gonna run you about $400, um, the way around that is to make what's called dummy bearings or setup bearings. Um, I use setup bearings, I don't have a clamshell puller. Um, and what that allows me to do, so setup bearings are just a regular bearing, and I wanna use new bearings, I don't use, I don't use used bearings because the tolerances are just gonna be too far off for my liking. So I, I got new bearings. You hone out the inside of the bearing to just enough to where it slides on and off the journal. That allows you to add your shims, set that bearing over, slide it right over, get it on there, take your measurements. You can pull the bearing right back off, make your adjustments, put the bearing back on, take your measurements, pull the bearing off, make your adjustments, and then when you're finally at your, your happy point where you know everything's set the way it uh, needs to be and you're ready to do your final install, then you can put on your new bearings that came with your master install kit. Press them on and then you don't have to worry about it anymore. Um, one of the other places you're gonna need a, uh, again, if you don't have a clamshell puller, but you're gonna need a setup a race for the inner pinion bearing. And that race will, will go in and out of the housing and allow you to adjust your pinion depth. So while they're not specialized tools, those are gonna help you tremendously um, until you're ready to do your final setup. Another, another thing that you're gonna need is going to be a setup pinion nut. And what I mean by that, you know, why does that matter? Let me tell you why it matters. First of all, this here, uh, when, you, when you set up your gears, your pinion nut is designed as a one-time use nut. People argue about this all the time. Oh, I'll put on the red lock tight, it'll be fine. And then weeks later, you're hearing about how somebody's pinion nut backed off and their pinions started rattling around in there and they destroyed their gears. They're like five bucks, use a new one. Don't reuse these, I'm telling you, it's just, it's not worth having to spend you know, $800 to get your gears reset up because you used your pinion nut more than once and it backed off and damaged your gears. Um, so when using um, a nut to set up your gears, I use a setup nut. I take an old nut that was on there before, I go to the threads with the Dremel, and I, I take the edge off of those threads, because those threads in there are pretty sharp. They're designed to cut into your pinion grip and hold. That keeps that nut from coming off. Another feature of a new nut too, if you look, you can see how it's oblong there. Um, it's called a Stover nut, and when it goes on the pinion uh, head, or on the pinion threaded side, it straightens out, but it's oblong because it's clamping down so it doesn't come back off. So once you use that, it's gone unless you're gonna use it as a pinion nut. But anyway, the threads are pretty sharp and if you keep putting it on the threaded side of your pinion over and over, it's going to gall up your threads on your, on your pinion. So that's as tight as I can get that right there without it starting to want to deform as it's clamping down and holding. You don't wanna do that until you're ready to do your final setup. Now, later on down the road, if you have a leaking pinion and you have to pull this off to change out your, your pinion seal, okay, I get that. Take this, throw it in the trash, get yourself a new nut, put it back on, and you'll be good to go. Um, I, I can't stress that enough about pinion nuts, and I don't know why mo more people don't use just a new nut every time they do that. Um, with that being said, I think we're all ready to get into the gear setup itself, so sit back and hopefully we can walk you through doing yours. When I say we, I mean me.